Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with Paul Tang, founding principal at Verse Design LA. Paul Tang got a B Arch from USC, graduated cum laude, MArc from Harvard GSD with distinction. Over a case of beer, he accepted the challenge to design a chair without designing it while at Harvard. Students debated whether the case of beer should go to Paul or to the algorithmic process Paul developed with the assistance of Spiro Polalis, if I'm saying that right, professor of design technology at Harvard GSD. Paul taught at USC for 19 years. He was selected by USC to be academic director of its American Academy in Shanghai. He founded and became a partner in Verse Design Shanghai. He returned to the US and used momentum from China to co-found Verse Design LA. I'm really interested in speaking with Paul today because he has interacted with algorithmic AI as it relates to design. And I've been playing around with chat GPT in the last uh, month a lot, and it is just mind blowing what this thing can do. And it's going to drastically change everything that we interact with, I believe. And I am very interested to talk to Paul about his take on this. It's got a lot of really good insights on aspects of design and how it's going to change moving forward. So let's see what Paul's got to say. Give it up for Paul Tang. Paul Tang, welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. I already did an intro uh, before this, so we'll just get right into it. Okay. Nice meeting you. Thank right. you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you because you have experience as a designer, but also someone who has interacted to a high degree with technology and could speak to more so than other designers probably the uh, the integration of AI into the next phase of humanity to some degree as it is it's going to interact with uh, design and architecture in the built environment. Um, but before we get too deep into that, um, I wanted to start out, you had a quote in the summary that uh, Tom, our common connection, had sent us that uh, said, architecture is frozen music. I'd love to start out by getting your take on what you mean by that. Well, I, I think, first of all, um, architecture is not something it's not a form of art where it actually is out there promoting itself, right? Actively. Hmm. Okay. It, it is, yeah, what do you, it what do you actually, mean by that? It's actually quite mute, right? And I okay. used to joke around, the architects is not going to stand next to their, their work and pass out uh, pamphlets to say, hey, would you like to know my idea about my building? Right. right? So the narrative component of it, it's through the experience of the audience. Right. And the narrative they take away from that is not always the ones that we think of as the designers or as the author mm -hmm. of the building. Right. It's it, the takeaway usually is generated by the audience, by the people who, who experience your, your, your building. Um, and therefore it's, it's mute. And that mm -hmm. in terms of a frozen music, it is frozen in the sense that it's frozen from the perspective of the author. Mm. In other words, so, I can only communicate through the work in itself, uh, but I don't control necessarily the outcome. And it may not coincide with the original ideas, whether it's performative or there is a loftier uh, conceptual framework. That mm -hmm. is really up to the audience, right? Right. So it it would be similar more so to uh, painting as far as art in, in what you're saying more so than Absolutely. something like music or, okay. Right. Something right, that's right, right, right. created and then lives a, in, in many ways, a static life that then takes uh, consciousness to interact with, to, to come to its fulfillment and what it was intended to do. Exactly. And so there okay. is another statement that I always say, you know, architects don't finish our design. It's the end user that actually finishes the project. Right. Right? And this is not original by any means, right? Elder Rossi wrote right. that in his, his, um, in many of uh, his writings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, to, to many architects chagrin sometimes when we come to photograph it. 
<laughs> yes. They've, they've yes. moved in too much <laughs> in some cases. Okay. You, you know, so, it's, it's amazing. That component of it does surprise me. And it's a pleasant surprise more often than not. How so? Well, you get to see how people actually use the space. They adapted or they adopted to a different performance that you originally had conceived of. And it's always exciting to sit there and, and just observe, right? As, as a, uh, almost as a third party. Yeah, it's almost uh, the same thing uh, how, we'll say music from the 50s, 60s, and 70s started getting a new life when it came into hip hop and then dance music and EDM music, uh, where they took old hits and started reshaping them into new right. hits that were from a reference past. Or now when they do mashups where they'll take, you know, the chorus of a song and completely play it over another song, but they'll change the tune enough and the cadence and everything enough. So they actually blend together and sound amazing. Like they'll mix BGs and Ace and ACDC and it's like this should not work but it has this new life sometimes that's just amazing and and so I think I kind of read what you're saying in that way I guess yes absolutely and this okay in a funny way actually does lead into some of the things I like to explore right I'm far from being a techie mm -hmm. uh I'm of the generation that transitioned from the traditional pencil and paper to the digital screen Right. Right. And I'm I'm definitely not the parametric uh, designer by any means. I do understand it. And part of it has to do with the years in academia. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that it, it raises these old questions that was raised 20, 30 years ago about authorship. Right. Particularly okay. with AIs. Right. Mm. Right. There, there are people out there talking about um, how do we protect the um, uh, the copyrights of mm -hmm. the authentic original work, right? When the AI right. is actually going through the international in the internet to source data, if you will, right, to generate its own kind of the the AI generated uh, the images that we're looking at. So, in that regard, I often question then is. If we take that same concept and frame it to Duchamp, when he replicated mm -hmm. the Mona Lisa, for example, right, or when he submitted the urinal uh, as a art form, um, somebody designed that urinal. Uh, right. Somebody, the, the Mona Lisa is, is by far not his original work. It's the Leonardo da Vinci's work, right, and but it begin to speak of a culture, it does begin to question the idea of authorship. Hmm. And so, you know, it's, I don't think it's just architectural. I think it's, it's really coming down to this larger level of the ability of our society to really think much more critically and hmm. recognize the authenticity of the original, uh, I shouldn't say that, the authenticity of the original thought Mm, and not be so okay. hooked up with the work. Mm. Okay. I mean, you so, do need to respect it, right? Yeah. All right. There's there's a there's a complicated thought that I might be able to get out there. Um, <laughs> I'm 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 seeing just like from what we were talking about the trend in music from like the '60s to now. It in some ways being being my age, I'm 46, almost 47. Um, uh huh. In some ways, and it might just be because I'm getting older and it's common that anyone that gets to this age starts to see the same thing, or maybe there's actually something here. But it seems like the amount of original music, the quality of original music today is not as prevalent as it was in the times that we are pulling inspiration from to make these new forms of music. So if you look at like the, you know, from, from the twenties through up to like the eighties, just 60 years there of really intense, like uh, almost exponential curve of creativity and change in music. 
and most all of it, you know, fairly original to a degree. I mean, there's always inspiration, but it seems like it's getting more and more remixing of what's already been created as, as we go on. And also, I think there's probably a business industry that gets in there and starts to form it to like in the way that life forms are typically uh, bifurcated, if that's the right word, mirrored, two eyes, nose, you know, there, there's a deep commonality between all life in the basic form that it takes uh, to a large degree. It seems like with our own creative um, concepts that we come up with, music to be an example, it seems like a lot gets explored, but you end up with eventually this very common uh, summation of the thing over time. Now that's, that's a really hard thing to understand, but like if you look at cars now, they're getting to a point where it's this somewhere halfway between a car and an SUV, like a Honda right. CRV, it's like becoming like, uh, this is about the average of what everything's going to be from here out. It's kind of like you reach this, that is the pinnacle of usability maybe for the car. And so you commonly get this thing, but it seems like it's an amalgamation of everything that came before it. And this is the most average and most useful thing that you end up with. In some way, it seems like there's something like that happening with uh, our creative outlets. Like we've honed in on the different story types that you can possibly do, that you'll end up with the uh, the hero's journey, or um, I forget the there's like five major story types, but it it seems like music in particular has has come to this point where we're more so regenerating things, highly regenerating things rather than creating these very deeply unique works. Again, it might right. just be my age, or it might be actually happening. Now, I wonder where AI comes in, because, like, the, you know, the Wes Anderson effect on, like, just all the stuff that um, the Future Engine or any of those other, I forget what the names are, of the stuff that they generate, it just has the color tone and the palettes of a very strong Wes Anderson feel, or you give it any other artist, and it can just put it out there and it's just mind-blowingly good but it's it's is is it original because it's pulling from this vast data source of saying this is what everyone is appreciated we'll take the average of that and create it for you and you just ask me and here it is um what what do you see as the future of creativity with working with ai just in general uh, no matter what you're designing or trying to say, how is how is AI, in your opinion, going to, is it going to be a tool or is it going to be something that takes over and, and uh, kind of is a wet blanket for creativity on the human experience of it? Because there's this feeling of I'll never be able to do it as good as AI could do it. Um, it's a tough question, right? It's a really tough question. And I, I want to address a little <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's interesting. Um, before I ended up in architecture, um, from the age of 18 to 23, right, um, I was in the music industry. And okay. so, and this is late, you know, from 1979 to 1984. Okay. And so, so... In that period, one of the things that we used to refer to this is called sampling. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. We sample. Right. And, and there are talks about rap music as reflection of the actual sampling of what's happening in our society in certain sectors of our culture. And mm -hmm. so depends on how we look at the idea of creativity, I think. Creativity, in my opinion, is always a reflection of the conditions of the state of our society and our culture. Hmm. Right? People describe that as our our, our artwork. Right? Hmm. They're in different eras, um, and so, or we call them movements. Right? And so, so it's always a form of reflection. The fact that Duchamp managed to create the Mona Lisa as postcards is is based on the idea with the printing press. Now you don't have to travel to the Louvre. You don't have to have the affordability 
to appreciate their artwork. He's made it so that it's much more available to the general, the larger audience. And so cycling that all the way to where we're looking at today, it's a, in my opinion, it's a two edged sword. And you're absolutely correct, using music as a way of looking at things. I, I like that idea of sampling, even with like the creativity as how you work with AI. That's an interesting concept. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, it is. The key issue here really has more to do with, um, it is it is an idea about sampling, right? And so I assume, Trent, you also came from an architectural background. Yeah, I have my master's in architecture, practiced for three years, never got my license, went into architectural photography, and here I am. Okay, so um, maybe so. I, I know it's not as common today, uh, but I do think a good discipline as part of the, the education of an architect is this idea of precedent setting. Right. Mm -hmm. You look at the great works of the past architects and you try to figure out what it is that made these work great. Mm -hmm. So if you could look at that as a framework for us as architects and 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 obviously. I think it's not just for architects it's in, in any kind of the design discipline. Right. There's this old other old adage that basically says. Everything that's that you can think of has already been done. The question really comes down to how do you insert new life to it, new understanding to it, particularly post postmodernism, right? Hmm. Where 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 that idea is has already started to fray way back in 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 the seventies and eighties. I think what's happening today is it's just gotten more accelerated, right? And so, I think the 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 fact of matter has to deal with the intelligence that we as human beings. Uh, can insert into these artifacts that are produced, whether it's through our own hands or through a tool or through AI. Because at the end, if people make an argument, AI is only as smart as the algorithm written by the original author. But then I think mm -hmm. the, the, the conceptual framework behind the work is only as intelligent as the author who may not be the author of the original work, but it's the author of the idea through which the AI then generates, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't that familiar with uh, the, uh, the CBT, right? Mm -hmm. My son uh, showed it to me. He's a high school student. And I'm looking at it and being a parent, the first alarm that came through my head was, oh, my God, you mean you're not writing your own essays? Right. Right. And then he stopped me. He said, listen, Dad, I, I'm, that's not why I showed it to you. And he said, listen, here, I'm going to show you my outline. I'm going to show you my original thoughts and ideas. Right. And I'm just demonstrating this to you to say, hey, this exists out there. You may have these disparate ideas out there and you know there's some kind of a link in between them he sees i'm using this platform to help me in terms of being a better writer and then and, and then again he's critical in the fact that it's not great it's good enough for most people mm -hmm. he said what i use it for is, is i i use it as a pass to create a draft to see if actually it is the idea that i'm thinking about i just couldn't articulate Right, and so he right, used right. it as a draft generation to help him to hone in to his original concept. So I think as yeah. long as there, there is that component of it, uh, I don't take strong objection to it. And I do understand this idea of authorship. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're no longer the, the necessary the author of the end product, but you are the author of the process. Again, that is not nothing new. I assume when mm -hmm. you're in school, um, that was a topic because I know when I was in school, that was the start of this kind of discussion right, about authorship. Right. Right. So uh, let's see. There's there's two things in there uh, that that are very interesting to me to to follow further. Uh, one of the is, first of all, kids are so, so intelligent, just 
so unexperienced. And it's a shame that the amount of intelligence that kids have is wasted on the youth <laughs> yes. in a way. But they, then they need it. And, and they have this uh, intellectual flexibility at that age and that, that is just how it is. And they have to have that to make something of themselves. But it, I'm, I, I did the exact same thing and came to the exact same conclusion as your son, which I can do at 40. And I think only my life experience allows me to get to the place of understanding what chat GPT or whatever can do. Uh, and it's interesting to me that, no, that's not, that's not me having life experience and being able to do that. You're telling me exactly what I found in my experience with working with chat GPT, your son's doing the exact same thing. I have all these thoughts that I've written out that I'm trying to understand. And then I feed them into chat GPT and it feeds it back to me. And it's like, all right, what I think you're saying here, and let me put this in a bullet point. And it's like, wow, you just helped me understand what I'm subjectively perceiving, but not able to very clearly articulate yet, but you're just helping me kind of regurgitate it and organize it and collate it in a way for me to understand my experience in a way, which, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. The other thing and, there and, is- and, and, and if you don't mind me just adding in one real quick sure. thing, the fact that you and I are having this conversation, which is in essence to explore that very same topic, Right. And, and when we're in school, there may be times we have all these thoughts and ideas. We put them down in bullet points and we talk to our quote unquote professors or someone that we believe has the knowledge base. Right Now, if right. The, the AI has its ability to process such large database in a very short amount of time, that's where I find sort of interesting. And this is an idea that just occurred to me as you're talking is that you're using this platform as a way to kind of vet things out, mm, mm. right? It's no different yeah, than yeah, talking yeah. to someone with the wisdom, traditional wisdom, I, right? The you're, you're making give me goosebumps here, but the 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 amount of time we were driving from Ventura back to Maine uh, about a month ago, and I spent yes. a solid ten hours interacting with chat GPT while driving down the road. My, my wife was driving. I wasn't driving. Um, <laughs> and I realized like this, this is like having an all knowing voice in your head. The, the, or yes. It's like having not an all knowing voice, but everything that humans know, you get to have that as, all right, I can access everything that humans know. And I can ask a intelligence devoid of emotional bias to uh, help me know and properly align the logic, reason, and facts that we do hold for my understanding of a concept that I'm working on. It's like right. you have a personal uh, instructor or tutor to help you through all the complexity of the new ground that you're trying to make beyond what is currently known. And so it, it gives you this feedback and it pushes you on to the right path to say, we well, can't really do that here. That's a, that's an opinion, but this is a, this is a tried and true fact. And it, it really, I, I found that through that time interacting with it, um, I, I felt like my thinking afterwards was very much turbocharged even after yes. leaving, because I started taking what people were saying and I would mirror what chat GPT was doing to me. It would say what you're, so it sounds like you're saying this and then I'd summarize it and then I'd ask a follow-up question and then a you know, and by doing that, it's like, oh, wow, you can, you can move your articulate intelligence here and you can move your emotions here and you can listen to one and you can think with the other and listen to one and think with the other. And it's, it's really powerful. And I see, I see AI as having all the potential of humanity in that it could be absolutely amazing and it could be the worst thing ever. That's us. That's right. That's every single that's person right. that's born. They could be Hitler. They could be Gandhi. You never know. So the, the other thing that I found in there is, and I'd, I'd start out by saying Kelly Slater. Do you know who Kelly Slater is? Yes, absolutely. He's the... Okay, the surfer so dude, right? yes, he started out surfing in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was right. a whole style 
of surfing at that time. They were not leaving the wave and going into the air and spinning around and landing and keep going right. and going, whatever. It was not like that. It was power surfing and it was, it was very antiquated to that time, right? And 10 years before that, it was way different. 10 years before that, the boards were different. It was all different. But unique to Kelly Slater, he took when most surfers at the time, when they developed to the highly talented competitive surfers that they were, they would have a style that was like, if, if you watch a lot of Americans will stay with the style that they graduate high school or they graduate from college from, and they just won't update. And you'll just see them wearing stuff from the time when they graduated because that was the peak for them or, you know. And this happens with athletes too, that they'll reflect the style of the time when they came to like their late teens, early 20s, their, you know, athletic peak. The weird thing with Kelly Slater is he kept being able to reinvent himself like in his 20s and then in his 30s, he started surfing like the new kids that were doing this thing. Yes. And so he stayed on the top and now he's 50 and still competing at the highest level. And he's doing all the stuff that all the other kids are doing. And this is some guy four, three, four years older than me. It's just insane. But the thing I wonder is like if you took a kid that was born in early 1980s and you let him start surfing and the style that that kid would form would be reflective of the current, you know, situation of surfing at the time. It's not like a genetic readout of, oh, this person is going to surf that way. It's just at that time, that's how most people surf. And so you observe that and you turn that into, you create into that athletic space what you're seeing other people doing. You're sourcing, you're... Um, your uh what what was the two words we were just using uh precedence and um sampling sampling to create yeah so you're sampling and you're using precedence to create your own surfing style and most people the average the average professional athlete is stuck with whatever they have but these outliers like kelly slater they can just update and they can they can move to the next level so maybe these Michael Schumacher's, Kelly Slater's, Michael Jordan's, LeBron James, they're to that next level where they can maintain this because they're far more a unique original creativity in some sense where they can, can change and progress far beyond the curve of other people who are more so limited to what they have available to them to take precedent and sampling from. And so in the yes. same way, as AI comes in, how is AI going to affect what we design at the time? Like if you can tell, oh, that was designed in the 90s and this was designed in the late 90s and this was the early right. 2000s. Our, how do we think like our designs and our creativity and our music and our art along with AI is going to be an incredibly power tool that we cannot avoid and it's going to be the best or worst thing ever. We don't know. How's that, how do you think that will change this trajectory of how the things that we do, the things that we create on a human scale, how they've been changing? Now they're going to change at a very different pace, I would imagine, with this turbocharged thing of AI uh, doing it with us, I think. How, yeah. How's that going to affect that? And is that going to be essentially now the Kelly Slaters and the LeBron James, how they're able to create and turn themselves into this thing that's more so than the average people, they can uh, uh, progress and stay on top. Is AI going to empower the average person in some way to have more of an aspect of that where they can change and progress along with outliers currently? I think it, it comes down to, I think it comes down to our society. Right, particularly the value system of our society. So, for example, uh, your reference to Kelly Slater, right? And I assume you served, and I, I used to serve as well. So we we have that common language. You got to remember all those quote unquote style. Part of it, it's not just the the, the surfers themselves. Mm -hmm. Particularly if these surfers are in the circuit for competition. Right. You're being judged by certain tricks that you pull. Right. Right. And there's certain things that score high. In my days, if you can catch a tube, that's golden. You Right. If you can manage to catch it, which is rare in California, but you could. <laughs> and if you catch one and you're able to sustain and come out of it without the whole thing crashing over you, 
that's a major score. But in the end, really, if you think about it, it's more of the condition of the wave than it's the ability of the surfer to, to come out. Right. And it's, right. it's all luck. Right. So, but those are well, the ones. Well, I don't, I don't know that I completely agree on there, but it's, it's that, yeah, the getting the right wave though, the people that are really good know what that wave's going to do. They can read a, that's right. a lineup. And that's a, right. You know, yeah, yeah, you're right. But there's certain I, I, days and conditions. Okay. okay. No, no, I agree with you. There's certain days, the conditions, you know, that wave is not going to crash in a way where it actually spreads to the, to the point where you can actually catch that perfect spot so that you can write it out. Right. Right. Yeah. And there are yeah. times where it just particular, I think it's, uh, during, um, change of tides, right. When, when the water mm-hmm. is, is, uh, God, the word is escaping me, but there are times where it just crashes really instantly. Yeah. Right. Uh, particularly Close up that. around, that's right. Right around Ventura area by Zuma, that mm-hmm. is known for just crashing really hard on you. So, yep. and closes out. So my point being is, so if you're competing in that circuit, you're conditioned. And your coach is because the, the, our society, particularly here in the U.S., has come down to this risk-averse society. In other words, mm-hmm. if I want to win... I want to know what will get me to win by the amount of scores I'm going to have, particularly like in reference to surfing competitions. Right. Mm-hmm. And so once you know that those are the things that can allow me to score, why would I try something different? Right. Unless, right. unless I'm behind and unless they're, in other words, I'm always looking for the safest uh, way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we are constantly being conditioned so I think that the, this idea of the AI really is somebody's got to be very critical in the sense that they need to start thinking outside of the box because mm-hmm. that, that AI is, in essence, a tool uh, that can allow us to be much more omnipresent, have mm-hmm. better understanding with, of all the different thoughts and ideas that are floating out there within the mm-hmm. Internet. That you mm. and I are also very limited, right? Um, mm. I, and so what the, the AI can do, it can source quite a lot of data out there and provide that output to you. But I think the criticality has to come to the individual artist mm-hmm. or the creator to kind of sort that through to differentiate what's real, what's an mm. opinion, and what are facts. And how do you okay. then manipulate and traverse through those different landmines, right? And ca- have something that began to respond to that. So again, right. it comes back to the intelligence that we put into the, the artificial intelligence. In other words, I, I see right. AI as more of a smart system rather than mm-hmm. an intelligence system. The intelligence still has to come by the operator, mm-hmm. whether that be the artist, the creator, you know, the programmer, whoever. Okay. So what you're saying there is, is helping illuminate what I think will happen a little bit to the creative process in working with AI. Let me see if I can get this out. Um, so what you said within uh, like a surfing competition frame, uh, there's certain things that are scored higher and right. you know what the judges are looking for. So everyone starts to kind of surf the same, but in the same, the person who can do the best of the same starts to get ahead and they win. Right. And so everyone tries to look the same, but just better at the same. And, right. and so the negative pushback on that is, for one, surfing is a very personal and expressive thing more than it is a competitive sport. It's that's like right. every person that's going out there surfing it's not like tennis. It's more like golf where it could be just you and the course. It's not two yes. people on either side of a net. It's not a basketball in a court. And it's very much you against the elements or with the elements rather than against. It's a very different thing as it comes to a sport. It's more of an expression and an art mixed with a sport in a way. Um, but as you were saying that if you when you overlay a, a competitive thing on it it starts to take that expressive in individual part of it out to a degree because you start to think less in 
I feel like doing this, but then you say, nope, I'm going to pull that back. And what I'm going to do is what I think I know they want. And I'll do that. And then I'll get yes. the score and then I'll win. But you don't, you don't express yourself as much. So the thing that I'm seeing in there that happens to the creative process that hopefully AI will turbocharge is the, the ability to uh, exist in the zone of proximal development within the creative process. Do you, are you familiar with the zone of proximal development concept in psychology? No. Okay, so there's this concept of, um, if you think of what, what is established being within uh, a circle, so everything that we know that is safe and confirmed as fact and reliable, put within a boundary. And then outside of that boundary is uh, the, the, the materials that you have to make new things out of, new connections, all the, all the potential and unknown, the chaos outside of what is established. Everything out there is the raw materials for creating new things. And that's as much as taking two existing things and mixing them can create something new but outside of the zone of where you're comfortable is outside of the zone of safety if you will so the right. so people who have an open disposition who tend to be first person very uh creative in a way that they have an open disposition which means they respond emotionally positive towards novel experience so going someplace they don't know is favorable to them rather than going someplace they already know so if you're living outside of the zone of what's established, you're outside of security and reliability. You are existing in a state of kind of chaotic state. And so some people can go outside of the safety zone and exist out there for a, an amount of time because of their personality, their disposition. And other people need to be closer to what's established. Other people can be farther out or for different amounts of time before they need to come back and say, I need to be in a place where everything's organized and people are feeding me and everything's reliable and it's safe so I can recuperate before I go back out into chaos and try and create something that makes any sense of the world to, to provide back to everyone. So how far away you can go from your zone of safety is, can, uh, is referred to as the zone of proximal development. So if it's it's uh, productive for you to be, you know, ever so far outside of it, you can be there for that amount of time. And that's where your ultimate zone of proximal development is. Now, if someone is highly conscientious, translate that to conservative, they'll say, no, we, we should stay within the realm of what we already know, because that's what's safe. A conservative person will reference what's already established as being reliable, true and good for everyone and they'll say if you're going outside of that boundary that's dangerous and that's where right. we have the left and the right political leanings the people on the right are progressive they want to move outside of that to find out what else can be true and to bring back in or expand that that zone of safety so they want to expand that out and the more conscientious people are saying no it's already established we're going to protect that boundary until you can really really prove that you can expand it so that zone of proximal development um, is, is where you can dwell to still thrive. You have enough risk, but you have enough safety. That's your zone of proximal development. Some people can be farther out. Some people need to be further in. It seems like with AI, where your zone of proximal development in working creatively, it could turbocharge how much further out that could be because you can go deeper into chaos as far as the intellectual process and you can kind of collect these notes as your son did, as I did, and bring them back and say, this doesn't make sense, but I do feel that there's something that is connective in there. What is it? And you can just run it by chat GPT and it can start to organize it for you and, and play it out. I had the most interesting thing happen to me where probably almost a decade ago, I went through a transition of questioning what I believe and everything else. And I had this poem that just came to me. I don't write poems. I don't like poetry, but this poem came to me that really encapsulated, I like some poems, I can't say that. It, it completely encapsulated everything I'd been struggling with. And it kind of sat in my head as a warning that I, and it was a uh, beware of hope born of fear. Its truth will be obscure. Its exposure will be painful. So beware of hope born of fear. It's 
truth will be obscure, its exposure will be painful. And so my dad's a pastor, and I had come up with this, and it was like the whole thing was there all of a sudden, which was weird. It, yes. I didn't take time, and, and it's never changed. It came out like that. I took that, and I put it in front of my dad, and I was like, what do you make of that? And no clue. It, it, at the first, there's too much emotional bias towards if you say um, hope and belief and, and anything else, there's preconceived ideas, especially in religious uh, spiritual circles, that put these things as sacred and non-questionable. And, and at the time, could not make sense of it. But I took that poem, and like two years later, they get it because of all of our conversations. But I took that same poem and I fed it to chat GPT and just, just like that, it translates and tells you exactly what I felt from that poem. Just like that. It, it's, it's astounding. Like a human couldn't get it right at first because of the major amounts of cognitive and emotional bias and protective That's right. nature of, and, but the AI doesn't have that. It just goes right towards the logic, the ration, the reason, and, and can create or help you clarify what you think you have from that and the 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 real uh concrete of the creative process is taking abstract subjective experience and turning it into something of more utilitarian ob objective nature for others to be able to grow or use from so the creative right. process goes from abstract subjective experience to objectified further concrete utility and i see yes. ai as being able to help bridge those two closer together at a higher rate and with a much higher hit rate i would imagine well much more efficient right much right. much more yeah. efficient right so yeah. yeah it would take years and years for some researcher in the past to really start digging through to get that original data from which to even start processing. Right. I think the amazing thing is, is with, uh, with the AI system, because of the, the worldwide internet, their opinions, their information that's out there. Um, and, and what AI can quickly do is to consolidate that and deliver it to the, the, to you or me or whoever is asking that question in a much higher speed. But I do think that the intelligence or the takeaway that you and I have once we receive that data is still up to us. And therefore, the mm. interpretation of that data is still up to us. Mm. Right. So if we can divorce ourselves from this idea that there's always an in artifact, which means that there is a physical object, whether that be an image, a sculpture, a building, architecture, whatever you call Mm -hmm. If it could just be in an intelligence and only see that or understood as that, then it's up to us who uses the AI tool to really begin to, to take that data that you have received and make it into something that's much more um, interesting, if, if for the lack of word right mm. now, or yeah. much more creative in that sense, right? And and this this uh, and I thank you for this this thing that you, that's uh, called the zone of proximal development. I think what's happening with our society is, given the technology and the advancement thereof, we've gotten lazier. And the, mm, and yeah, and this yeah. this zone of proximal development is actually shrinking rather than expanding. Right. I right, think the, right. the 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 the, the the turmoil that we're seeing today is because of AI. It allows you to see what otherwise that circle of comfort like this, mm -hmm. it actually is much, much bigger, mm -hmm. right? Because the information's out there, but whether the reliability of that information or the, 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 the requirement to verify, now you got more information coming at you, but you actually don't know what's real and what's not. So what happens mm -hmm. is that the mm -hmm. perimeter of that circle begin to fray. <laughs> and we yeah, actually yeah. don't know where we are anymore, right? right? And so this is this is the complexity. This is where all this distress is coming from, right? right? And so what we need to be do is what we need to learn is to be much more intelligent than that. Is to say, mm -hmm. wait a second, we got to get away from this traditional way of thinking. 
right? Mm-hmm. Which is particularly here in the U.S. And, and I'll give you a good example. Before I had an opportunity to move to Shanghai and uh, through academia, and I brought my practice out there because it was 2009. Uh, given the Great Recession, there was nothing happening here. I just basically moved my entire office out there. Before you I take care of family China, and everything. Oh, everything. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So it it, it ends up to be the most um, was the best decision I made. Right. It, hmm. it literally changed my practice to the point where I, I don't have the I can't teach anymore. I don't have the time. But I hmm. think what's interesting here is before I left. Right. I get clients that were asking me not necessarily whether I had the experience in doing certain project types, but the hmm. ideas that I'm pushing out there, whether it's been done before. And then hmm. if I say and my typical response is, listen, Design is a creative act, okay? Where you end up coming out of that process is always a limited edition, right? It's Mm -hmm. unique, right? Because it's the end of a creative process. And that is the objective of a designer. So if you ask me whether this idea has been explored or this concept has ever been done before, unfortunately, the answer is no. And then the answer that I would get is particular for commercial clients is, hey, listen, Paul, you're a great designer, but we're just looking for something safe. We don't want to be your guinea pig. Right. So what they would say, hey, listen, due to cost, due to a variety of reasons, just give me a simple box. Right. Because for me, my cost to build this simple box as to oppose a much more expensive building to me, the amount of income I'm going to generate, the value I'm going to get out of the building, other than the cultural value, which they don't recognize, it's the same, right? Because they're talking about dollar dollar values. When I get to China uh, in 2010, that's what I landed. Right? My team went there in 2009. I quickly discovered I was posed the same set of questions by my clients over there. And I thought, oh, shit. There we go again, right? Same set of questions, and I'm sure they don't want to be my guinea pigs again. So I go through the same spill, right? Say, hey, listen, design is a creative uh, endeavor. Everything that comes out at the end of it is a is a limited edition, yada, yada, yada. And the clients there, given the culture of the time, right, which has changed since then, they look at me and say, say no more, Paul. Listen. Are you sure it's never been done before? I say, absolutely. Then they say, God dang, man, you got to better hurry up. I want to be the first. That is the attitude shift. Hmm. So the, the thing I lament about practice here in the United States, our instrument of delivery at the end of the day, right? Our working drawings, our construction, our contract documents, right? That thick mm-hmm. for a tiny little building. And you actually go through it and you'll realize how much CYA is in that document. And what are really, truly the information you need to make that building real is maybe what? At best, 60%. The rest Mm -hmm. is just to the best of my information, yada, yada, yada. Therefore, I hold no responsibility. So I think what's happened here is our society has conditioned us No different, and I I agree with you, surfing is probably not the best analogy as a sport in relation to the discussion about AI because it is unique. It's almost zen Mm -hmm. in many ways, right? But if you take it back to other more competitive sports, is we're almost trained to the point of doing what will what we believe will benefit the most. Right. And and that's conditioned by our society because that's the way they score us. And therefore we stop pushing that envelope. But what AI does is now is saying, all right, you may not want to push the envelope, but I have information and data that's way the hell out here. So how Mm -hmm. do we as a society today push the envelope and says, you know what, let's take some risk. Let's look at it differently, right? right? Let's really go out there and celebrate the idea that we have individual thoughts, individual ideas, that we can push the the envelope. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, uh, finish your thought. Sorry, I'll, I'll interrupt all day long. I'm working on not interrupting people more these days. <laughs> That's all right. We're, we're, I realize that when you're passionate about what you get into, 
I love it when I get interrupted in that way. I hate it when I get interrupted <laughs> out of disrespect for my kids. So anyway, so <laughs> so the difference here, I think I, I almost lost my train of thought. It, it's the, the sad thing that I don't see, right? And it is that they're not out there. Now, we can easily all call it a tool, the AI. But uh, that tool... The intelligence of that tool really comes down to the person who's using it, Mm -hmm. right? And if you're lazy, if you're not, if you don't have that critical mind to really take advantage of it, Mm -hmm. all the problem that's currently being discussed and presented by the media is absolutely true, right? You you then really have a problem with authorship. You have a problem with authenticity, right? But the fact is then if you come back from a much more critical state of mind and you start asking for example is there really such a thing as being authentic like what is Mm. authentic right what is original where is that genesis that originality if you start questioning in those ways you know when someone refers to being authentic as it relates to food it just says it's been made in the traditional way it's authentic Mm. Oh, but right, isn't right. that right? Isn't that a way of just copying what the old chefs are doing? So right, where's right. you as a new chef? Where's your new creativity? Man? Right. right. This is you an could, authentic song that I'm copying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. But it's authentic in itself when a rapper, when when Run DMC took uh, Aerosmith is Walk This Way and rapped it. Right. right? And so... Yeah. It's a whole different twist to the what otherwise was a blues-based music by by Aerosmith, and when so, when DJs yeah. start to mix, they don't call themselves the artists. And in fact, I'm quite surprised. My son is also getting into music, and I realize they don't even differentiate this idea between who's a producer, the writer of the music, versus the writer of the the lyrics. Right, and there's right. actually a platform out there. You can actually people can upload their music for artists to put lyrics to, and to to change into something completely different. Right, right, right. So we we got to that point where the ability of the AI to share the availability of that data has become so broad, it's beginning to fray this zone of proximal development, or the mm. perimeter of that zone. Of, I think that's where. Where the uh, oh, I can't remember the word, but Alberto Perez Gomez had mentioned something about. Um, well, let's not deviate there because I can't think of the term. But in any case, <laughs> I do think that the perimeter of that circle has definitely started to fray, and okay. or maybe it's not even a word of fraying. It's just, how do you draw that circle? How do you draw right. that boundary now? Right, it's next to impossible. So there, there's two, again, two things that come up in, in listening to, to what you're speaking to there. One is the, the lifespan of any, any system, anything, any consciousness. So the lifespan of uh, humans and how they change from when they're young to when they're old. The saying of, if you're not liberal when you're young, you're heartless. And if you're not conservative when you're old, you're brainless. This is a Right. that uh, people repeat a lot. I don't, it, it has a lot of truth to it, but it's not like a limiting thing either. Um, and, it, and it applies, I think, to what you were saying about the, the resistance that you met in the U.S. and the lack of that resistance that you'd meet in China. So uh, two countries at different life uh, trajectories or different points in their trajectories uh, as countries. Um, and then also uh, what, th- what, how different psychological types relate to that zone of proximal development. So first of all, um, the, the lifespan, you, you, when you're starting out, you have to push yourself to be more open to what's potentially right. possible because you have to find a way of establishing yourself, taking care of yourself, taking care of those who love you love, and then, you know, after that, you protect what you establish as a means of protecting yourself and those you love. This is coming from a very masculine perspective, you know, obviously. Right. But 
you, if you have to be open to say, here's all the possibilities, I need to be open to all of these, and then you hone in on, okay, architectural photographer now. I hone in on that. And it's really creative, and it's outside of my zone of proximal development when I'm starting. But as I'm starting and doing that, as I bring that, that proximal development zone kind of into the circle of what's established, it's like kind of go out there to establish myself, but the closer I bring it to the zone of establishment, the more I can charge for it. Because out here, I have a high degree of creativity, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I can't repeat it every single time as reliable. That's right. But I'm probably a lot cheaper at that point. So as an architect, you might say, let's take a chance on that guy. And then you might get crappy images back, or you might get great images. You don't quite know. But you know if you go with someone who's started out there but over time has moved what they do into that zone of reliability, they're not going to be as creatively fed when they're being creative within the zone of proximal development that they've now established. They are not going to be personally receiving as much emotional positivity or whatever in that moment because what they're doing is something that they've done a lot and that they've kind of perfected and they know how to do. They're not feeling the way through it and creating as much as they used to. Now they can show up at a place and just know exactly what to do, even though they haven't been there before. They're now operating within the zone of uh, what's established. And so I'm at that place now where I can charge a lot more. I know exactly what I'm doing and I can get really good results very reliably, but I'm not being as creatively fed within the act of doing that as I was when I was starting out. But I'm yes. protective of this now because it provides for me, it provides for my family. And now I have to work on protecting my own emotional stability as it relates to executing on that thing because now I have to do that over and over again and achieve the same results and continue to do it to provide for my family and for myself. Unless I want to take a risk and like shoot way out here to somewhere that is way outside of my zone of what's established to maybe do another thing to bring in there. But as a human and as me, I feel like I've got only so many things that you can exert that much energy to go that's that right. far out and bring something back in. So that that's one kind of thing that over a lifespan, I think a country does that. So you're trying to pitch things to people in the States and they're like, just give me the reliable thing. I don't care. I need to just make financial sense here. I don't want to be original and create. I don't need to establish. I just want, just give me the reliable because our country yeah, has gone from this. Right. Go ahead. What, what they say is they don't want to be the patrons of architecture. Right. Okay. It, it's, they they yeah, just want to be a client, right? Because what right. they're saying is, listen, I have no interest in endowing a piece of architecture to future generations. Right. It's not a right. museum. It's not a gallery. It's not any of these type of public buildings. I just need a building to house my employees or, mm -hmm. the, or whatever their, 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 their performance requirements right. are. Anything above and beyond that, they're not interested. But right. um, the thing is, so so you just you, you hit it spot on. Right. So I think I think this is where this is that subtlety. Right. That I think has made it work for me. Right? I'm still a small practice, right? Right now, I only got seven people, okay? But we compete, like we just finished the 450,000 square feet building built in the U.S., right? I, I can't even begin to tell you what we've done in China. It's amazing, the quantity. I don't know whether I could do that again today over there because uh, the political climate and the cultural climate and the social climate has changed dramatically. Oh, in China? It's, yeah, it's precisely that syndrome where you don't have it. You go, you do everything you can to get it. Once you have it, you do everything you can to protect it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so what happens is that the zone of proximal development becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Right. Mm. Because you, you're you're now saying this works for me, right, and given right. the, the limited resource I have in terms of my time and resources. Right. I'm not getting mm -hmm. paid to be creative. I'm getting paid for what I, what I do well. So the, right? the pushback so, I would say in there is that it's not that the zone of proximal development got smaller as much as the client's willingness to go outside of it. Is or, gone. Your, or, or, 
or, or your willingness to take yourself outside of it. Okay. okay yeah. Maybe that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, and there's that, yeah, that lifespan of any country, any person, any, any organism initially they're willing to go outside of that zone of proximal development that's right but as they become established they're less likely to take risk and they hone in on exactly what has established right. them so so you're right don't change. it's not that it's not that it got smaller it's that the perimeters got more fixed right right don't go outside of that okay. perimeter because you'll bring this that's whole right. business crashing down you know that's right that's right and so so i think that the to overcome that right? Because we are in a creative endeavor is that you, you need to first understand, right? How do you then, because otherwise everything will stagnate. Mm -hmm. right. Why even right. bother designing? Just regurgitate, right? Right. Classical um, works. Let's stick with that. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, so part of this, this kind of a rude awakening for me is when I was out there overseas working is the wait a second here. Number one, 90% of my clients, right, uh, are not interested to in becoming a patron of architecture. Okay. While I'm out there preaching all these other intellectual ideas that you can embody, but it's really just an enrichment of my students, but they're not being taught in a way in which how they can address or satisfy those components as a professional and still survive in a world where you're, you know, 90% of your clients are not interested in, in having any of that discussion with you. Right. So then, you know, that was a bit of a difficulty for me to even, you know, it's really disappointing to realize that point, right? Almost the point is to, what the hell am I doing? Right. And, and because it's, it's a reality that sets in where you're saying to yourself, I can't survive. If I really want to do what I think is creative to me and explore those avenues which are outside of that proximal development uh, boundaries, I need to be able to, 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 to risk a little bit, which is the livelihood of my family. Mm, right, and if right. you can't afford to do that, you're stuck. So right. the question then is, is maybe I need to change my attitude in understanding what their needs are hmm. and, and somehow make that connection to start to erase that boundary in a way where I can start making connections and bring them out of it. Right. right. Rather than this, this very contentious discussion hmm. about what's a risk. If I can make that thing so that it becomes common sense and it's not a risk, why wouldn't mm -hmm. you do it? Yeah, Why wouldn't yeah. the most conservative client do that, right? So, mm. so every client's different. Everybody has a slightly different value system. So the decision was, I need to learn their value system and kick them where it hurts first. And once I do that, I can then justify what I want, which may be outside of that boundary, and to see if I can start making connections. Because the other thing that you need to recognize is that all of this, all of these things that you and I talked about, is still within the definition of what we call context, right? Because mm -hmm. particular, I see, and I think you too, right? As a photographer, our work is reactive to something else prior, right? You, your work as an architectural photographer starts out with someone with a building right. or with, a, with an architectural piece. my creativity over top of your creativity. That's right. So if my creativity tries to make too much of my creativity, I'm going to try and sing a solo in front of your solo. And that's not right. going to go well. If I that's use right. all these lights and bells and whistles and try and make an amazing photograph to when people, when they look at the photograph, they say, wow, what an amazing photograph instead of what an amazing work of architecture I've failed. It That's needs right. to be about the architecture. I need to kind of disappear in that act. But there are times, I got to tell you, when we hire photographers, I just want to talk to them about my ideas and their ideas. Hmm. I believe I can hire any photographer to photograph the building as the way people perceive it. I think hmm. it's amazingly interesting to me. And this is why you and I were saying earlier that I find amazing 
given the speed in China, particularly, I was able to see my projects being used differently. Hmm. Like I like my photographers to arrive something of their own when they experience my building through the lens. Right. It becomes your work rather than the picture of my my building. Right. Picture of my right. building is just it's nonsense, right? It it's not nonsense. It's to me, architecture is always a backdrop. It's really about the lifestyle and the life activity that happens within those mm -hmm. architectural spaces that you create. Right. So so I think that the, the the key really is how do you harness that so that you actually allow everybody to be creative, whether that be you as the photographer for my buildings or the end mm -hmm. user who uses my building, which I stated earlier, the people that finish the projects. It's not me. Right. right? So so in terms of AI, if you see all that as part of the context that you need to start addressing Right, because even what I do is a re it's a reactive act, it's a reaction, right, to mm -hmm. my perception of the society, the culture, the client, the performance requirements, right, all that stuff, right, because mm -hmm. it's not the traditional uh, artwork where I have absolutely an open canvas or free hand. The, the the level of the the need for it to have these performative. Um, requirements, it makes it much more difficult. So it, it's always interesting to me, for me to tell someone that this is my building when in fact I didn't pay for it. I was just right, a designer right. of that building, right? So right. the owner really who, who if by our art standard today is really their building, right? right? Legally, it's their building. So anyway, that then goes back to this this issue that that people have difficulty with when it comes to AI, I believe, it, it's it's not as a direct and it's it's a, and I admit it's it's a it's a very difficult concept to arrive at. At sometimes is it's that once you start to open that boundary up in the sense of how you understand the original the notion of being original, um, then in the end it's it's you're always you're doing certain things, you're using AI tools, you're sampling from music, you, you're whatever it is that, that your creative endeavor is, whether that be serving as a stylistic creative endeavor, whether it's team sports, right? Whether it's in design of a building, uh, being a, a photographer or any kind of creative work, or just a simple writing of an essay, right? Or the creation of a poet poem. I think this this ability, the only difference between what we do in the past as opposed to with what we today have as the AI system is before, because of the limitation in terms of the our awareness of our context, okay, is mm -hmm. very limited. Now with AI, our awareness of that context mm, yeah. is almost infinite. Right. So then it is up to then the individual to really put a, a priority or a hierarchy in terms of the value importance to consolidate mm -hmm. that in la order for me to generate some, the next generation or whatever it is that I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's called design then, right? Whether that yeah, be yeah. writing a paper, writing a poem, whatever, right? So, so I think that the, 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 the difficulty and, and, you know, I'm sure when you're going through school and when I started teaching this whole parametrics is really popular out there. Everybody's looking at the digital tool, the computational approach and asking, what is that in terms of design? And I think now more and more of us are realizing that what it is, is the, this, this past genre of form finding. And I love those, fantastic forms that are generated, right? Or in fabrication, they're great. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that that when it comes to a more advancement of this technology and computations to the point where we actually have much bigger data, in other words, we have a much better way of understanding our context, is that it, it's not really in the, the technology should not just be in the making of the building as a physical artifact, but in terms of how we understand 
architecture as a cultural uh, practice, as, right. a, as a practice that reflects a society, our value systems, right? So right. it does require the author, if I can use that term, or the creator to really verify the, the, the validity of those data that you get and mm -hmm. also place a value system on that so that those two are then reflected in the in work, whether that's a sampling of somebody else's work, in my opinion, while it's important, it is not important as important as the authentic thoughts, right? The intelligence that you put into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, so- The so, epiphanies in many ways. Yes. And so if you look at human history development, it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. Right. And and when I started to engage with China in late 2000, well, actually it's longer than that. I, I've always been very curious. You know, we accuse China of being very good at making copies. Mm -hmm. They're excellent at making copies. Right. They can take, take a thing apart and immediately they can replicate it almost like the real one. Right. And so there comes intellectual right, right problems, all that stuff. It occurred to me while I was out there, I learned, you know, traditionally, the way the Chinese people learn is by copying. Mm -hmm. They make replicas over and over again until they have uh, learned the, the, the art form. And then they start developing beyond that. Mm -hmm. Right. So so the and, and, and so if you look at, at that, the, the other thing is, is that there is one art form in the Chinese culture that we generally have celebrated and never accused it of being a copy of anything, which is Chinese landscape architecture. Mm -hmm. But if you then look into the canons of the original point of departure for the Chinese gardens, it is all about fake mountains and fake green trees, bonsai trees, small miniatures. So yep. in a funny way, they're all copies, right. but they're real authentic copies. Right, right. Right. So, so I kind of learned that term when I was in China, when I was on my way to the uh, Xi'an's, um, oh, what's the, uh, uh, the tomb of the, the, oh God, what would we call it in the U.S.? Unknown soldier, um, tomb of unknown soldier? No, it's that, that we, big tomb of the, the emperor where they on earth with a lot of the terracotta, so the terracotta. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know okay, what you're talking so, about. Right. So, so what happens is I was with the students on a bus and we're to the, 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 the terracotta soldier site. Along the way, you will see these people trying to sell similar small clay replicas. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can bargain with them, right? You can barter. You can bargain. So it just happened that the bus we're on had a flat tire. So we were asked to get off. So all the students and myself start walking the, the edge of the streets where they're, they're selling these in these hawker stands. The tour guide that was assigned to me, uh, as I was about to finish in transaction, he looked at me, he said, listen, don't buy this one. You being a professor from USC, I can get you the same price and get you a real copy. And I looked at him and I said, what the hell do you mean by a real copy? A copy is a copy, right? He said, listen, these ones compared to the ones that you will see at the museum are actually identical. They're made by the same people. The only difference is the one you buy at the museum comes with a certificate that says, this is the product of the museum. It's branded. <laughs> That's the real copy. Right? So that idea right. stayed in my head. And I keep saying, well, what's the difference? The same... It's the same artisan, the same artist who made the same thing. It's the same clay soil. Everything's identical. The only right, difference is right. one has a certificate of authenticity. Right. Whereas the other one doesn't. So the one that doesn't that has the, the certificate of authenticity is the real copy. Whereas the one right. that you buy at the side of the road, I assume that then you call it a fake copy. Nevertheless, for the Chinese, they recognize both as being copies. Right, right. Which for us, the minute it becomes a copy, has no value. Hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. 
right? The, or so, the value so, is drastically decreased. Right. So, so I guess in a funny way, with this AI, right, is the question, can you make, in, th- in terms of authorship authenticity, can we take all that, that information and make mm-hmm. a real copy out of it? Okay. So I, I think that, I think what we're hitting on here, and I haven't really thought of it in this way before, is that uh, the, the zone of proximal development will be drastically expanded potentially within the creative process. Because before what we were, what we had known, um, what was available to each one of us was relatively what we could conceptualize and contain within our own thinking within our brain. That's right. Now, now the internet age came along and that drastically expanded, but to work in real time with the internet, almost inside your head, get Neuralink and we're going to be there soon right. enough. But right. it's like the zone of proximal development just expanded exponentially to where your clients are right in the center usually. And you're kind of going out here beyond the zone trying to get them to join you out there. Now with AI, you can you can essentially expand that zone out and say, no, no, it's safe. Look, you can come out here and we can see it from here and it's going to be okay because I can show, I can show the, what is it, prom- provenance in a way. You know, I can show yes. the steps to get from here to there. It's safe. Come join me out here to consider this. They can go out there and, oh, yeah, this might be a great idea. We kind of see some validity here. So you can kind of make the provenance from the zone to out into chaos, which is no longer really chaos because we have this really highly powered tool, essentially now in AI, to shed a light out into the chaos much more uh, powerfully, if you will. Yeah, It's only chaos to us human beings, though. Well, chaos the, doesn't really exist, in no, my opinion. No, right, exactly. It's a state of mind, right? Is it becomes you. more chaotic <laughs> to me because I can't, I can't think of it, or I <laughs> can't grapple my, I can't put my head around it. It yep. becomes chaotic. Yeah, yep. right? but we, so now you have this much. You have the availability of data more. to you is infinite, right? And so yep. maybe it's not about it expanding. It's really about the erasure of that zone. Mm-hmm. It's subtly, it's disintegrating, right? We're we're becoming much more ominous present with the aid of AI. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're becoming okay, much more so, ominous aware, right? Yeah. So the zone of proximal development is based on what we have essentially created, right? So That's everything right. inside the zone, if we think of it that way, we've gone out there, done the hard work, and brought these new truths back, and we put them inside the fold, if you will, inside the. That's gate. right. It's like we can rely on these things and only the really, really, you know, creative, crazy wackos leave the city fortress where it's all safe. And they go out into the woods and they find stuff and bring it back and say, look, we can use this to make our fortress expand. We, I found right. a new brick and we're going to expand the wall just a little bit with it. And then right. all the people inside say, you know what? I think you're right. And the fortress expands a bit. AI just turbocharges that uh, fortress. Now, the interesting thing here, and I wonder if this could be a dangerous lopsiding of that equation. I don't know. It's just a concept. But personality types, the, those who are open have a natural propensity to thinking or believing or feeling that the, and those are three different things, uh, to feeling that the zone is larger than it is and those who are highly conscientious that base their emotional stability on what's already established, they think the zone of proximal development is actually much smaller. So uh, if you're conservative in nature, your, your propensity is to say, what we know is the only safe space to be and we stay within here. And if you're very open in nature, you're going to say, we do have this established space, but actually... It's, it's bigger than you think it is. And, and whatever is out here is open to interpretation. And so our, our boundary on where the zone of, uh, or where the things that are established are is actually much bigger. So to convince someone who's highly open to join you in going out there is not an issue. It's, it's not that hard. But they typically will have a lot less um, risk in doing that because someone who's highly open is usually going to associate themselves with their life priorities of being able to 
venture out there and back and forth. It's more so in that experience of back and forth than establishing themselves firmly in what's already established. I just said a huge word salad that doesn't, we need AI to kind of regenerate what <laughs> yeah. I just said so we can understand it probably. But the personality types help that, the personality types work together to expand what is known. And now with AI, we've essentially created a tool that embodies the personality. Uh, no, it, 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 we've created a tool that those who are going to go outside of what's established can kind of take like an oxygen tank with them and survive out there for longer in more chaos to understand more because they have an immediate reference towards what is known within inside of what's established while they're out there, in a sense, if, if we will. Yeah. And they can make more sense and bring more back. I, I think it's it, the more so I, through our conversation, which is great, um, uh, Trent, maybe it's not about the expansion of that proximal development zone. Well, let me, let me be clear in yeah. uh, the proximal development. I do yourself a, a real service and go and read about this because I'm probably butchering it and, and fitting it to myself a little bit. But it, right, it's a right, right, very, right. very handy thinking tool. So That's right. So so we may be butchering it, but in terms of how what we're referencing it in this conversation, for the lack of a better word for it, let's just call that, right? What, what I'm okay. actually suggesting is I think what's happening here is I even question whether or not it's it's really not about the expansion of that zone or, or the perimeter mm -hmm. of that zone, right? It's really whether or not if given the speed to which data are made or information are made available to us, is that that zone is actually being erased. Because no, say that be, again. In other words, this idea where there is this proximal development zone, right? A perimeter, mm -hmm. the circle. The perimeter. So the, the perimeter of what's established and what's not established, your zone of proximal development will be different for each person because someone who's open can be a little further out and survive right. and be comfortable and come back and others. So right. my zone might be out here. Someone else's zone might be here. Someone's might be way out there. But you have kind of the, the known and the unknown and a boundary between right. I think that the, the, the general average boundary, right. in other words, there's no more average. Slowly that average is being erased, right? It, mm. It's because with internet, with the advances, these, these uh, internet, um, the ability of, for everything to be very customizable to individual taste and wants is much higher than when you and I grew up. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. 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 Like, I, I don't even know, understand how music is being pushed out there without the radio. Right. But when's right? the last but time you happens. listened to the radio? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So so the, the idea that there is this zone and I'm sure it still exists, but because the ability to draw to draw a norm, I think is becoming more and more difficult. So once you can mm, accept yeah. that. Uh, to yeah. me, it's really not about bringing your client outside of their zone. It's really about illustrating values to them in a way that they can understand it. Because as I'm saying this again, given this tremendous amount of information that's out there, is there really a zone? Mm, and I bet right. you your zone and my zone are completely different because our exposures are different. Right, right. Because our exposure is different, the way we search on Google Apps are different. You and I could put in the same thing into the the, the search engine, and we're going to get different things that come back at us, given our past algorithms. Right, right. So right. it's it's begin to promote much more of an individuality than this other traditional risk managed approach of trying to put everybody in the same box. Hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's only a, right. So, so there's a contradiction that. So, it just occurred to me that I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. Uh, using my son again as an example, because my son is right at that difficult age of being a teenager, right? And I realized that I'm becoming more of my own father than 
me and where is he's actually a reflection of me. It used to be when my father says wants me to come in, he'll say, stay out. I would just come in just to be. Right. Uh, just to be different or just to be defiant. Right. And so so but then I'm thinking at the same time, I've been telling my son, don't always operate in the box. Question yourself to say what's on the outside of it. Make mm-hmm. your own decision. So today, where everything could be so easily customizable to the individual wants, and you have an AI system that can consolidate all that information to you, why aren't we out there celebrating it? So if I can successfully understand their value system, use this as a tool, and show, show them the trajectory, this is your value. Right, right, right. It generates the type of value you're interested in, Right, and if along the way I can add my own personal ones, as a as a creative person, then we both win. Hmm. And so it's that little bit of a twist. Once I have to contextualize everything, right, make it so that I understand it's just no different than say a physical context I need to respond to, a programmatic context I need to respond to. To me, this is just another context. Then if you think about AI with the availability of me to really source that base information to create the arguments that I'm looking for to help me convince that these are of value to my clients, he win, I win, I get to do exactly what I do. So the amazing Mm -hmm. thing is, ever since that became crystal clear to me, this idea of value engineering rarely exists with me anymore. Mm. Interesting. I, I'm I'm gonna say something that may offend some people. Oh, good. <laughs> we we've, we've become a lot less creative. I think so. In in some right? ways, we, yeah. we are now we are now protecting those assets that we've done through the risk right. we have taken. Right. Forty years right. ago, fifty years ago, now yep. we are really that old person, me, yep. just protecting my resources, and therefore yep. I am risk averse. Maybe this proximal development that we're talking about in a different way is really that perimeter of zone of comfort. Mm-hmm. It's that zone of risk. If yeah, you can yeah, start yeah. saying that AI is now allowing us to have much more tentacles out there, right? It, it just comes down to a discipline of us as creators, then we really need to push the envelope now more so than before to really push for people to be much more critical thinkers. Mm. Right. And and rather than just doers, just I, I don't that's not a good way to, to, you know, just to regurgitate things here. Here's a here's a thought. Um, I wonder if AI is a tool that will very much not manipulates the wrong word, but will modify our lifespan propensity from. You know, when, when you're born, your consciousness is just so small as, as, what, right. as far as you know. And it needs to be so boundaried and protected because it is so incredibly right. sensitive and vulnerable. And it goes through a period where it's very protected. And then all of a sudden it has to it has to turn into almost like a gradient that's that is open to everything that's possible. And then it finds that thing to grab onto and then it slowly contracts back in and becomes very solid and then eventually dies that's kind of a lifespan of a human it starts out very small and protected and then it has to take a risk to expand and then when it establishes itself it it cohesives back together and then solidifies over time and then essentially plodes (laughs) um i wonder if ai can manipulate that in a way to where that expansion out can be much further maintained and not have to come back in so hard after after reaching out to establish uh maybe it can can thwart that propensity to to coming back in and and solidifying into this rigidity to support the now what's been established kind of mindset right so that 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 lifespan uh ai becomes very much so a um it's a life support system while wandering into the chaotic yes so as you as you move into the unknown you have this lifeline back to what's established 
to make sense out there in what's unknown. So you're, you're very much leaving the space shuttle on a spacewalk, and that thing connecting you to the shuttle is kind of the AI in a sense. And you're able yes. to go out there and exist and say, all right, I can do this work on the satellite or whatever, you know, and, and I can be maintained and I can fix or I can create or do whatever out here in this danger zone. But I still have this link back to the mothership. And as far as everything that's been established that we've done over time is over there being channeled to me existing out here. And then we can really create something great in doing that. Because I always thought AI would just take the normal like low line like just you know jobs that like are less intellectually creative or anything else i just never mm -hmm. thought really that ai would come from my job as an architectural photographer as a as an engineer or an architect or a musician or anything else but after playing with just chat gpt i realize all everything will be taken over and done by robotics and AI eventually. And it leaves us at the tip of the spear, essentially a very razor thin tip of the spear that we have the ability to subjectively experience. And that's going to be our, our last greatest uh, asset in a way that we can contribute. And I also think that this is probably in a sense, our last breath of humanity being the most articulately intelligent uh, entity that we, th this will be our last breath of being the highest intellectual intelligence once AI comes in. And eventually yeah. AI is, is going to be much more articulately intelligent than us, but it'll have no real subjective experience according to itself. No. And, but in, and, and, in and, interacting with it, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, no matter what it can become, I believe it will never become human intelligence. It's always going to be artificial intelligence. It's intelligent. Well, well, why are we call it artificial? Well, well, so it's the same concept. What I said, it's a fake copy, but it's real. Ooh. Right. Right. It's right. a fake copy. So it's a, uh... Like, <clears throat> if your son never interacted with any other human, he would not be able to have articulate intelligence, right? Well, no, because there are other sources of information, right? No, 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 no there, words, no words, no speaking. He's just I by see. himself, and, and he's, you know, fed from a tube that comes out of the wall. And let's right. say we do that with an entire generation the world over, hypothetically. Right. One generation and everything that we've built up is gone. Because we do not uh, genetically are, are we, inherit. Are you suggesting something like Matrix? You get plugged in? Well, uh, I can go there too, but not, not, not <laughs> currently. But I mean, like we, what we inherit from our parents is ideolo ideology and, right. and, articulate intelligence the ability to logic reason and think like words right. are a tool that we made like currently apes and ravens are kind of entering the stone age I, I guess where they're starting to use physical tools to meet physical needs so an ape will take a or a, a chimpanzee they'll take a stick and dip it into a termite mound to pull out termites right right they're using right. tools Ravens will drop rocks in water so a treat that they can't reach will come up to where they can reach it. So right. they understand volume, you know. We, at some point in the past, long, long ago, uh, started to develop a highly articulate way of communicating emotions through utterances, guttural utterances. So the emotion of negativity was expressed as no, and positivity was expressed as yes. And from there, we graduated to creating more intricate tools to the point where we have words that we use as intellectual tools to meet intellectual needs between each other and, and for each right. other. So now our emotional state is communicated in these articulate tools called words. Interestingly, the, the things that we utter that are not articulately accurate are names. And they are things that are not able to be understood within the utterance of the thing, 
but are a thing that call you into relationship to then know what the meaning is. So Paul Tang is your last name. <laughs> Paul <laughs> Tang, I can't say that I know what the word Paul Tang means unless I have a relationship with Paul Tang. So right. a name is not a word, it's a name. And to know the name, you have to be called into relationship. But with words, we've extracted these out of us into the common space between us that we get to pull from through languages to have intellectual tools to work on the things between us that we're doing. Just like I use tools to work on a car or anything else, we have words to intellectually create and, and do things with. And we've now taken that technology and we've lifted it out of us and put it into a computer program that can do that for us. We've created this next level of tool through this, these words, and they go by an almost mathematical precision of logic and reason in a means of helping us, uh, like kind of see, like throw stuff on the wall and st see what sticks in a creative process. Now, before yes. I thought AI was going to take my creativity from me or my, my value of my creativity from me, but I, I am starting to see that it will be far more of, of a just turbocharged tool that I will be able to use within my own creativity, that it needs that from me just as much as I will need that from it. I That's right. I think that the fact that we feel threatened today is we can't keep up with it. Oh yeah. We can't yeah. keep up with the speed of that information that's coming at us. And so, so it's becoming hard. Right. And I was just telling again, I, I keep, I apologize because I got two teenagers. Right. And this is, I got, I got two father. that are almost teenagers. <laughs> uh, well, you just wait. So I was having a long conversation with my daughter yesterday and I said, listen, the concept of hard, you know, something that's being very hard is really a, a individual thing. It's not really hard. It's, it's, uh, I forgot the word I used. In other words, when you say it's hard, it may not be hard to other people. But this is not to say that there's no challenges. There's mm -hmm. always going to be a challenge. So the idea is, is don't just give yourself an excuse for not doing things because it's hard, but always be ready to take on that challenge. So I think what's happening is, is, because of the speed, right? Because of the availability and, and the quantity, we are slowly falling behind and saying, it's just like, ch just keep up with our emails on a daily basis, right? You have several hundred emails, you, you need to go through it. And if you don't, you feel like you're missing out. So I think that the, 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 the threat that we're feeling, if, if we can learn how to harness that, if we can learn to really, because at the end of the day, I still would say that artificial intelligence is only as smart as the human intelligence. Right. And it's never yep. the other way around. Okay. And so it really comes down to this other sort of the humanistic, what you can call as articulated intelligence is to, to make that into something that's much more meaningful to us mm -hmm. with an emotional attachment, with whatever baggage that we can think of. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's just, it's just that information. Hmm. In other words, it's it's just it's always there. Whether you're able to grasp onto it or have it collected into any one spot, it's it's there. It's it exists. So so the, the fact that we are now able to to really harness that through this artificial intelligence as a tool, they are made available to us. We're just looking at it and say, oh my God, rather than sourcing through five different contextual issues, I now may have billions, if not infinite amount of contextual information I need to process. Mm. How do I do that, right? So so maybe right. maybe the next iteration is, I don't know, maybe this is what Star Trek has been messing with, with, <laughs> with, uh, with data, right? Uh, being sentient, right? right? Uh, maybe that's where it's at. I don't know. Now, now that's gone way beyond my ability to speak intelligently about any of this, that belongs to some philosopher who may have a much broader view. I, I just think that we need to be more disciplined. We need to be much more um, 
critical. And when I say criticality, critical, in my opinion, is not about your opinions of others. It's really your opinions about yourself to push yourself, mm. right? To, to take that next leap of faith, to improve yourself, to become something more than just what your comfort zone tells you that you are right. or need to be. Right. right. That comfort zone is, is uh, very, very dangerous uh, as it well is. as one of the most valuable things you can have to establish yourself. But if you establish a base camp and never leave it, what are you doing out there in the first place? Yeah. Why are we even, in terms of architecture, why aren't we still just living in caves? It's safe. Right. Right? So, so Or just I think classical I, architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, right? So in my opinion, it, it, it's, it's a difficult question. I wouldn't even say it's a question. It's a, diff- it's a very difficult issue that gets the core of who we are as human beings. Yeah, And I think it needs to be understood outside of just the fact that it's technology. Hmm. Right? I, I did a... Go ahead. No, it just needs to be addressed beyond... Or it needs to be stopped. It needs, we need to stop framing it under under the, the this sort of bigger banner that this is a technology issue. It's not. Right, right. Right? The availability information, there's been leaps and bounds and every time we found ways to I, I, what's a good word to take advantage of it to make mm-hmm. something different a zeitgeist right a whole change mm-hmm. and so now we're just at that cross by the, the next zeitgeist and the question is is how critical are we going to be especially we are of a generation that are much more spoon fed mm-hmm. i think our yeah. generation's ability to be individual is far less than before and I think the hope is with AI, if you can think intelligent about it, it actually promotes individuality much more than before. Hmm. But when you yeah. when, when the when the human beings are conditioned to be just be safe and always operate within the proximal development zone, you're not going to take advantage of that, right? That's right. when you allow AI to take over. Oh yeah, no. It, this I have to say, this is the best. Uh, conversation i've had with someone over a zoom link it, it's not easy yeah. to to have a zoom link no. podcast conversation but the um your curiosity and intelligence uh overcomes that so that's great thank you for that um no thank you for it. it's one of those conversations that's been hard in in the thinking and really right. enjoyable in the spirit and, and <laughs> i really appreciate that it, it's it's uh i i love trying to say things I don't understand and seeing if I can get to a point of understanding them. And, and you've been able to help me say a lot of things that maybe hardly anyone can understand today. <laughs> so, well, likewise, great. it's, it's this type of discourse that I don't believe that we have enough. Yeah. So the yeah. last message to your audience, go and watch wall E. Remember that, that uh, animated uh, film? Yep. That's where we're it's headed. Not- yeah, we got to watch Wall-E and really look at it with a critical mind. Yeah. I, I yeah. didn't think of it until I saw it again recently. It's, oh, my God, this is hitting everything that I've been thinking about almost spot on. Yeah, the, right. the creative types, they got, they got a vision for the future, the potential of the future, and they serve as prophets to a large degree to, to put a story yeah. out there for us to avoid. I think that's yeah. how creativity and, and, uh, and people that are – Profits, I think, are just kind of more so the highly creative types that can project current behavior into eventual reality and can and can form and help us see that and steer away from it, hopefully. So, you know, so I, I think that AI can only be a threat to us if we become complacent. Or we we become active and in intentionally using it to negative effects. So hopefully no, I hope they but, back but off to do in that- six months. Right. But to do that is that we have to allow them to do that. And yeah. that's what I mean by being complacent, right? It, you can't, this thing about human intelligence that you and I talked about, I think is just something that we have. Mm-hmm. And, and hell, we created the artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's, it's our creation. We are, we are taking the place of God in relation to this thing whatever it is. And it's a scary thing. Cause I always had the idea that what if God's neighbor was like 
you sure you want to make humans? Like, it, it can go really <laughs> wrong. Yeah, it's going to go wrong. God, I wouldn't do it, you know? And then, like, the, <laughs> exactly. the next week, he's like, see, the very first two already messed the whole thing up, you know? And God's That's like, right. Ah. <laughs> so, That's you know, right. depending on your perspective and whatever you believe, you know, it's we're we're doing it right now. So hopefully we do it Let's right. do this. Yeah, let's do this. We can easily carry on another hour, I feel. So we, we do need to call it quits. So yeah. thank you so much for inviting me. Um, are you here or are you somewhere else? Are you in, in uh, Southern Cal? I'm in Maine. We we live here in uh, Maine and we spend probably six weeks out in Ventura every winter to get away from uh, the winter. So I see. Okay. Well, when you're in Ventura, let us know. Yeah, yeah, it, we love it out there. Um, it's it's a real it's a real great time for our family to get away, spend time together, do some surfing, and uh, recuperate. <laughs> well, at least I know one thing: you don't need a stick of a wetsuit. Uh, not uh, as much do, as do you? you need out here. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, I look forward to meeting you in person when we do get a chance. Yes, that would be great. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I had eight questions and we only got one done. So we're going to have to do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> great. Let's do that. Nice meeting you, Trent, awesome. by the way. Thank you so much, All right. Paul. Uh -huh. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>